Hey guys, welcome to what should have been final episode on the redo of the Galliano junk pile. Um, I've got some good news and I got some bad news, which usually my bad news is only bad news to me, but good news for you. So I will tell you this. We glued the back back on. We done a bunch of internal work, and then I loaded this guitar up and took it to Flagstaff, Arizona, and did a sound check with somebody. First time out, strung the guitar up their way with their tuning, and it worked, and it worked great. And let's take a look at that right now. Why am I pointing this way? Anyway, for added effect. Wasn't that awesome? Of course it was. That's why I put it here. But then something happened. The tuning that um, you heard that song played is a drop tuning that I'm not going to share with you. Uh, you can get your phone out and play over and over, try to figure out what it is. But the strings are so slack on Bob Logg's guitars. They are literally ready to fall off. So the first time I set up a guitar that Bob was going to play, he told me the heavy string, it's a big string, you don't want to tighten it up past the note because if you do, you will literally break the neck off of one of these old silver tone or K guitars. And he was right. Now, I didn't break the neck off because the neck is bolted on. We put a lot of effort into that. And if you are just watching this episode, click the playlist up there and see what we've done with this guitar because we reinforced the neck. We've reinforced everything. Now, here's what happened. I put a different set of strings on it and tuned it a more normal way, say open D. So I took it into Ventura over the 4th of July weekend with the intent of have, having someone play it. Now, you know we put a great deal of effort into making, you know what, wait a minute, I see you. Just because I take this guitar out of the way does not give you the right to covet this 1954 Gretsch Electromatic that is not all messed up. It has the original pickup, original electronics. But as many of them did, the tailpiece snapped off. Yeah, you're going to see this again, but on my time, not on yours. Anyway, back to this. You know we put a great deal of effort into getting the neck angle right on this. And you saw what we did to the inside. If you looked at um, 
the episode called Internal Surgery. Again, that playlist is up there. I'll, I'll just give you a link to Internal Surgery right up there right about now. Anyway, so put the uh, right strings on it for open D uh, and tighten them up. And the next thing you know, the action's too low. The action's too low. Now, you know on these guitars, typically, when the neck needs to be reset, the action is too high. Well, we set this up with the straight edge and everything to make sure that the um, floating bridge here was set, bottomed out. That way, it could only go up. But I was raising it and raising it, and still, the strings were hitting a couple of frets right in here and it didn't seem to get any better so I did a little work on the frets and thought and marked them up with uh, a sharpie and all that. Well it turns out that the part of the arch top right here underneath the floating bridge was sinking and then I made a great discovery on the base side the big string side over here when I got the guitar you can see that we repaired a crack right here. You see that crack right here. And when I got the guitar, the part of the body right here going to the F hole was really low. And then we discovered on the inside that the tone bar had popped off. And I'm going to explain this to you a little bit right now. You'll see it again when we open. But some guitars do not have cross bracing, ladder bracing, X bracing, whatever kind of bracing people make up names for. These guitars have tone bars, meaning there is one brace that runs alongside here, starts off at the near the edge of the head block, runs all the way down to the tail block. There's two of them and you can feel them. If you stick your finger in through the F hole, you'll feel it right away. You can also take a piece of coat hanger, bend it, run it in there, make a mark on the coat hanger, put an L hook at the end of the coat hanger, stick it back in and hook the other side of the tone bar, figure out the width. But those tone bars have no reinforcement anywhere else. They just run the length of the body. Now we know that one of those was off here. So what I've discovered was part of the failure of the top of this guitar was the base side strings pushing down, everything pushing down until it pushed down enough to sink the top and virtually pop off that tone bar that was loose. Now, had I known that we were going to have to fix this with the back off when the back was off, I would have come up with a contraption that I'm going to show you how to do this time. But that's going to involve removing the back again. Now, I see a lot of videos out there where people are like, oh, use tight bond, oh, use this, you don't have to use hide glue. Well, guess what, son? Had I used anything but hide glue, I would not be able to heat up palette knives and remove this back very simply. Now, of course, we're going to go through it again. We're going to put marks. We're going to make sure. But this back being on here the way it was, and after we've made all these repairs, it's gotten used to the guitar. So this will be pretty simple, but we are going to take the back off again. Again, had I used anything but hide glue, I would not be able to heat up palette knives on the hobo hot plate and take this off, make it all nice again, and get back in here relatively easy. Now, a little dilemma to deal with. If the top is collapsed, and I want to build this back up, by putting in support braces that are kind of arched to the to the same arch as the top and go from here to here inside in two places that basically sit down or push up this way and they incorporate the two tone bars how am I going to do that well guess what we were smart enough to take that piece of sandpaper and lay it right here and while this this arch top was up and at the right radius we sanded the bottom of the floating bridge so that fortunately when we did that all we're going to have to do is lay this floating bridge 
on a piece of wood like this that's cut two of them taped together and we will be able to cut our radius let me see if I can do this don't eyeball that guitar pay attention I can basically take the radius that's at the bottom of the floating bridge now and create it here and extend it and make what's basically two braces once that radius is there this sits up and then of course we're gonna to have to notch out here and here for the tone bar I'm gonna show you how to do this I don't give up on these guitars this will play again and the good part about it is Bob Log the third made it scream we know it'll work but um, I have to do this you know that I just have to um, I don't care how many hours I got into it if you want it you will pay so Let's get to the bench, and I'm going to walk you through how to do this. There's somebody that was asking a question on a different channel about how to do a sunken arch top. And there's actually two. Uh, one's my friend out in New Jersey. He called me up and had a guitar that wasn't worth a whole lot and was asking about a sunken top. And I told him, pulling the back off of a guitar is a big deal. Um, you're going to put a lot of time in. So he found a way to hydrate the guitar. I'm going to give you a link to that episode. Hey, Tom, thanks for that one. There's another guy who's suffering the same problem that I have with this one, with the tone bars breaking loose, I believe, because he opened it up. I'm going to give you a link to that one, too. And he's asking for a solution to that. And I think once we do this, I will show that to him. I will tell you what, any guitar, including, do I have a card left? Maybe, including the... Uh, the K1, the big bodied K1 that I did for Troy Murray, I put Gibson 57s in it, and had to alter the tone bars and everything, maybe episode up there. But I guarantee you, anytime I open one of these up and find tone bars, I am going to have this configuration ready to drop in. And of course, that involves doing templates. Sorry this was so long in the opening, but I laid out the stuff that you're going to see happening right now so let's hit the bench okay this is going to get really confusing really fast so stay with me here you remember that we put dots once we had the intonation which is back a nut to 12th fret same distance of the middle of the 12th fret is where your bridge goes and of course this tunematic bridge has ways to adjust the individual strings and where they hit to make make sure that that dog keeps barking incessantly. Anyway, we've put marks there and there. Now, what I need to do is I need to know where the bridge sits once I get inside the guitar. So what I am going to do is put Chick Flick Teal Pointer away, and I'm going to use Handy Dandy Tape Dispenser. Oh my God, this thing is incredible. And I'm going to take a piece of tape here, and I'm going to line it up so the edge of the tape is in the middle of that hole. And then I'm going to push it around to the inside. Once I know that it's there and it's straight here, it will tell me the line that I need to have on the inside and how far this is. So I want to put a, a basically a structure here and one here to build this up. But you can see how this is all bowing down and had I known better and had repaired things like this that had a crack here and here before I would have known precisely why this came my way and no one else wanted to mess with it so over here same thing I'm going to be right in the middle of that and I'm going to take this piece of tape and roll it underneath here now before I get to some other goodies that you're going to covet I want to explain the basic idea here. This is the inspiration for an arch top guitar. It's a violin. Everybody sees F holes. They think this is an expensive thing. And if I have F holes, it makes me classy. I don't know about that. I have a lot of F holes on guitars that don't make me classy. But here, here's the basic idea. This is all structured. It's put together sides reinforced you see that the edges of the violin body come over the sides that doesn't happen here Ken Parker uh, does some arch tops to do that I don't have any cards left or I would 
I'll give you one. But you see there are feet right here. This is where the bridge sits. Now, the way violins work is the bridge looks like this. This is not a violin bridge, but pretend it is. It sits here, and underneath here, there's what's called a sound post. The violin is built for a sound post, which is basically a piece of wood that is cut to a certain size, and is it inserted here and flipped up and put in place like this, so the top and bottom soundboard back on the inside. Yeah, Fred signed that for me, Fred Wallachie. Love, love you, Fred. Thanks for all your help. But you'll see people putting a sound post in a violin with a tool, so they basically get it in there and then flip it up. So this is supported using each other with a sound post. If I put sound posts in here, there is nothing that's going to do, uh, that's not going to work because it will take all of the tension of the bridge, all of the pressure, and put it to one spot on the back. And I guarantee you it will crack the guitar. So the idea of using a sound post or an overpass structure or something like that in there, all that is going to do is isolate the force that comes with all of this. And in a guitar that has no bracing anywhere inside, just the tone bars and the chick flick teal fabric we put in there, that's not going to work. So forget the sound post and the violin fix idea. Now, I would like to talk to you sometime about the resonance and how it works when you take a bridge like this on a cello or a big bass and have a, a sound post and how it takes a sound and takes it from the bridge and the bridge is basically moving back and forth like this. You draw the bow down, it loads up everything and it comes back, the sound post sends it down and loads it out into the violin or cello or bass a different way than an arch top. That's a whole lesson in itself. But now that we've got our marks in place, I am going to take off the strings and remove the floating bridge. And I kind of want to show you this. I got a 1950s cosmetic box that I keep all my stuff in, including this handy Milwaukee little drill thing that I use to take off the tuners. I should have a talk with you someday about what I have in this box and how it's arranged because I take it with me when I go out and buy guitars, but that's another time and day. So we're going to take the strings off. We're going to put a piece of tape underneath the tailpiece so it doesn't scratch up the top of the guitar. We wouldn't want that, right? Anyway, let me get the strings off and then we'll remove this. We'll take off uh, the stuff that's going to get in the way and pad this up because we're going to have to flip it over and it'll be time to remove the back. And there we go. And then I just roll these up. I'll be able to use them again when it all comes back together. And let's put those off to the side. Look at our Eli Green hoodoo voodoo bead there. Okay, so now that we're here, I'm going to point out, again, we have the center line is here and here. We um, spent a lot of time sanding this. And you remember, the piece of sandpaper that we had was about this wide, and it was taped to the top. So the part that we are going to reinforce right here, we'll put two braces one here and one here, and that will help us pick this up. And again, I'm glad that I put the time into developing and fitting this to the top of this guitar before this started to collapse, because now that it's collapsing, I can basically see air underneath here. So I'll know when this is right, when this gets pushed up to the point where there's no air under the bridge. The last thing I want to do, because these things can get turned around pretty easily. I'm going to put this one on here, and I'm going to put a blue one on this side where the bass string is. Because if this were to get turned around, it would look the same on these 
um, two pneumatic bridges, this side sticks out towards the uh, base string up here. But if you turn it around, it's the exact same thing. And remember, we fit this to here. So this side underneath here is actually different than this side. So blue base side. So we'll put that aside. Uh, now we're just going to pad this up um, and turn it over and remove the back. Okay. Deja vu. Hey. I'm going to put some tape here, like so, in about five different spots. And I'm going to make a mark there and there, etc., etc., on all the marks because we know what a hassle it was to get this thing lined up the last time. It's going to be easier this time because it's had some time to grow into itself like a new pair of shoes. Isn't this exciting watching me do this? Why am I tearing the tape? Well, because it's going to get in the way when I use the palette knives. There we go. Luckily, I've done this before, so it's easy for me. Okay, there we go. Now we're going to get out the hobo hot plate and our palette knives. And we're just going to heat everything up so we can pop the back off. Now, you want to remember, as before, the neck and the neck angle are going to have a lot to do when everything glues back up here. So we want to be really, really careful with this thing while the back is off because the neck joint is very, very fragile. Make sure I can see what's happening here. There it is. Because we could set off a chain reaction of problems even worse than the one we have right there. So let's get the high or the why am I saying high glue heater? We'll need that in a little bit, but we're gonna get the hobo hot plate out and I'm gonna take this off. And you watch it's gonna come off like butter with heat. Okay, moving right, right along, you'll remember that we used Granny's iron and the hobo hot plate here to heat up our palette knives, which look like this, this, and even one that I ground down to just get into the edge because we don't need to go past the kerfing. Notice chick flick teal kerfing. Not all professional luthiers, especially those that are not YouTube certified professional luthiers use. You put those underneath there and heat those up and swing this out of the way. Okay, if I want to speed up this process a little bit, especially at first, since this finish on this guitar is so messed up, I can take a heat gun and help things along here. And then I'm just walking along. You want to be patient. If you're going to use a heat gun, put your finger here. Because if your finger gets burnt, your finger is going to get burnt before the wood. Again, don't be doing this on some fancy um, arch top with the name Gibson on it or a wooden Ashland or something. Don't do that. Just use your patience. But we're just going to keep heating this up using the hot plate. And you can tell the hide glue just cuts loose and that's why we use hide glue and we're just walking around like so. There we go. Now, when it starts moving, you want to be careful that these places where we've fixed cracks, if you start getting where you're prying instead of working the glue loose, 
you're going to recrack things, so use your patience. Okay, you'll see as we get going here, things will start creeping along pretty quickly here. And I've made a couple of these, as you saw in the episode where I pulled this off. I just basically take uh, and bevel the edge of a piece of a cigar box side and put these uh, pegs in here so it doesn't fall in. And then I can just use these to move the edge or the gap that I've created by opening this up with those and keeping them open. But you're basically taking the small one and getting in here and then you're just rocking it back and forth because it's just riding the curving and you just work that very slowly and you'll see that it just melts that high glue and now we're getting to the tail block now the tail block is glued in a little bit deeper and so that's when a little bit bigger palette knife will come in handy but on these guitars as I've said before guitars that have a lot of bracing and stuff you start using a big knife the next thing that you see that hide glue is melting off right there you can see it on the thing but you start using these big knives and going in here you might be getting underneath a brace that's running this way and then you're gonna make that brace loose and you won't discover it until later very seldom do you have to take the back off of one of these guitars they're a nightmare to line up so avoid that if possible all right we are down to the midpoint of the guitar so what i'm going to do is i'm going to start back up here and then work this side and get back down to here now okay i don't want to be redundant here but you don't get these shots very often so again you're just rocking this back and forth moving the heel forward letting the heat sink it in and after a while it will just start to walk forward and get going too fast when it quits slipping, it's going to need extra heat. And again, notice that where I've opened this up, it only goes in to where the curving is. And then when it quits walking, right back to the heat. Okay, we are literally on the last couple of threads here. There we go. Now we want to make sure that wherever it seems to be hanging up a little bit, like right here, that it's going to come off. But this literally took me about 25 minutes if that yeah we want to be real careful now we're going to be back to doing our sanding again what do you know a piece of our fabric got hung up in there, but this looks familiar. Now it's just lining these marks up here and bracing this to match this radius with something that will drop down and incorporate these tone bars into the fix. So in other words, something that drops down here. Let's make those. I want to make sure that there's nothing cutting loose on the tone bar, and that's exactly what happened right up here. Okay, while we got our hot palette knives here, we can just go along and scrape some of this glue off and gives our, give ourselves a head start. Okay, guys, sorry, not sorry, but an executive decision has been made by the executive producer, me. I've been to the end of this episode. It's very long. It's more than an hour long. Now, as much as my content is interesting, I do realize that some of the length of my, the length of some of my episodes 
may be prohibitive to your life. And this one in particular, I'm worried that if you have any, like at your age, surgeries, uh, you need to check with your heart specialist. You might need a, an organ transplant, anything. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to interrupt anything like that that would stop you from giving me not one like for half of an episode, but two for the other half. No, in all reality, we got this thing back opened up. I think that's a lesson in itself if you didn't learn anything from the first one. And it was certainly a monumental tribute to Hyde Glue if nothing else. So, you think I'm going to leave you hanging? No, because of those of you who have stayed in here till the end, persistence pays off. Now, you know about the Sean Mann Dude Collection guitars. Yeah, the Galliano came out of it. Worst guitars ever. Oh, that, you can't see that. That part right there is the part that you're going to see at the end of the second episode. I mean, so I guess some people are good at stopping videos to see something. So let's try it. Ready? And, and no, I don't have a GoFundMe or friends only or, or anything like that. But anyway, junk guitar. Not everything that comes out of the Sean Mann collection is complete garbage. For example, I see you coveting this guitar here. What is this? Well, it's a Stella. Is it really a Stella? Because Oscar Schmidt was making Stella guitars up until about 1930. This guitar is a pre-war, meaning pre-World War II guitar, because it has a V-neck. We're going to learn more about this one in a future episode. But at the end of the day, this thing has slots for 12 tuners, making it mysteriously a 12-string guitar. It has a floating bridge, a flat floating bridge, not what you would see typically on a flat top. It was never glued down. And the biggest thing this thing had was a trapeze tailpiece. In what world do you have a flat top with a trapeze tailpiece? Well, I'll tell you in what world, in this world, do you know who this is? Do you know the story? Lead belly, inmate, murderer. Lomax has come to prison. Find this guy. He can play a 12 string. He can play slide guitar. He knows the prison and chain gang songs. They convinced the warden to release this dude by playing a song, a penance song a parole song, a pardon song, and it is Good Night Eileen. I particularly don't care for that song. Don't ask me about the people I work with in my day job. But anyway, Good Night Eileen got this guy out of prison. He ended up being a big hit, as big of a hit as you could be in the 40s and 50s. And do you see that guitar? Yes, that is a Stella 12 string. If you look close, you can see that it's got a trapeze tailpiece, kind of. But, straight out of Sean Mann collection, this guitar is the same model as this guitar. That said, give me a like, give me a subscribe if you haven't. I will pick up next week and we will finally finish this thing off and get it out to somebody to play it besides Bob Log. By the way, thanks again, Bob. See you next time.